gentleman you're cooking. Yes, we're rolling. Yes. Okay, we're rolling. The thing is about the film camera, you always need it, right? You always need it when you're rolling because you could hear it. <laughs> you can't hear can't it. Hear you don't it. really <laughs> even know you're being operated on. Okay, why don't you do is introduce yourself a little bit. Just say who you are. You know? I'm a painter, Carmen Cicero. I uh, live here on the Bowery, and I have been living here for a lot of years, and uh, enjoy it for the entire time. Now, you're, you think of yourself mostly as a painter, is yes. that, but you're also a bigger term like an artist. Isn't that true? You do other things? Well, you know, that brings up an interesting point. Uh, when I was in Italy, if, uh, if, I addressed m if I called myself an artist in Italy, this would be the height of, presum of presumption. You know, who, who you, you can't designate yourself an artist. You're a painter. And so, <laughs> and so soon I, I remember speaking to this Italian man, and I said, yes, I'm an artist. He said, oh, bravo, bravo, kind of mocking me. And uh, <laughs> I said, no, ma maybe I think I better stick to I'm a painter. And, uh, and the posterity has to define whether or not I'm an artist. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit about the starting of painting and where, when you started, what period you've painted. You, I know you have a big story, but you know, give me a little something. A sketch of you, really, uh, you really painted all your life and you started very young. You really you knew that. How did yeah, that I just uh, started as a kid, but I didn't think what I was doing was uh, significant in any way. I was just occupied in, um, you know, drawing and making pictures from drawing from cartoons and drawing from the usual things. Uh, art, the word art with a capital A never entered my mind. And then when I got into high school, the same thing. Oh boy, I'm, I'm some, you know, a couple of gals thought I was wonderful because I could draw and that was nice. And, uh, and some, of the, some other people around thought it was a wonderful thing, but seriously, no. Uh, then went to the Army. But that was interesting too. I was a, became a band leader in the Army because I was a musician. And I actually enjoyed my art, my army experience. And uh, when I came out of the army, I had the GI Bill of Rights, you know, the GI Bill where I could, not the GI Bill of Rights, but the GI Bill where I could go to any uh, school I wished to. I didn't know what the hell to do with myself, so I, uh, what's the nearest school? <laughs> that was uh, New York State Teachers College, and I kind of lucked out because this was a school that had some good people. And then I saw what art was, what it really was, uh, seriously. And uh, once I was captivated by this wonderful field, I uh, uh, committed myself totally and completely to it. I got myself a little studio. Was there a moment, do you remember that? Do you remember like... Uh when you felt that it was really important to you, or was it a sort of gradual? Uh, not really. Um, one of the funny things was I, uh, we had a room in the basement where they used to have coal, and they cleared that out, and it was just a little room, and so I painted this thing, cleaned it out, painted it white, put some lights up, put a canvas up, an easel, and this is my studio. So my father came down, and I said, Pop, here's my studio. Said, what studio? What do you mean studio? This, this is just a room with, <laughs> I said, any place you paint is a studio, and that's my studio. And uh, uh, of course, he thought, when I started to paint uh, in abstract ways, he uh, thought this was uh, the height of absurdity. And uh, it was a very curious thing. The first painting I ever sold, I sold to a museum, to the Newark Museum. And after that, then Pop was uh, bragging. Now, now I'm the star, and now, of course, not in my presence. <laughs> I could hear him sometimes talking to his friends. You know, I'm doing well. My son's got pictures in museums and such as that. Uh, but when, when, but you said you you started doing drawings. You originally didn't do abstract. What happened? No, no, because no. Abstract uh, is in a way the 20th century history of that. Art. When I got to college and met some wonderful people there, uh, I, uh, well, first, the first thing that I did was to have a lot of arguments with the professors because I thought Picasso was a charlatan, the usual. Now, we're talking a long, long time ago when uh, not very many people understood or appreciated uh, Pablo Picasso. And so I, uh, I had a lot of arguments with my teachers and uh, to substantiate my point, if you only went out and I looked at a lot of Picasso, 
you know, books and books on Picasso. And as one might expect if you're a sensitive person and you're an artistic person, pretty soon, particularly when you, uh, when you look at the very early works of Picasso and you look at a man who in his youth could outdo most uh, adult painters, and you had to own up that if someone can do this at the age of 10 or whatever the hell he was, uh, then there's something this man has. And this is this part right here, this painting that I'm looking at by this man at age 10 or 12, this is high level fine art. And if that's the level of painting at that age, then I have to uh, justify to myself why what follows isn't good. Uh, and so you one pays close attention. The curious thing was that the, those very early works of his were kind of like brute art, and they were difficult to understand. When he got into those classical periods, the pink period and the blue period and so forth, these were pretty much acceptable to most people. And, um, but once you, once, once, the, once you understood what he was doing, then everything that followed just, there was always a little shock when he changed. And he changed so much, but the man made uh, sculpture magnificent. He made pottery, it was magnificent. Etchings, they were magnificent. Uh, everything he made was magnificent. He just had a gift. He was a, uh, so you called him a charlatan. That's what I did. I called him a charlatan. Oh, I, I had to take that back and uh, I swallow From that. From studying him? You were, yeah, after I studied him. Right, tell me what happened when you were that little turn and when you, because you're really talking about the history of 20th century art in a way, and your education might mm -hmm. parallel that. Well, uh, there, there, uh, it, it's never one instance, uh, except for the abstract expressionist. That, was, oh, that wasn't one instance, but it was pretty close. I remember opening Art News, I believe it was Art News, and saw a, um, a picture of Robert Motherwell, one of the elegies. It, elegies. it was no bigger than this. That's how big it was, that big. One of those elegy things. And it was in black and white. But of course, the work was in black and white, so it didn't matter very much. And I said, oh, this is, this is absolutely remarkable because even after following the work of Picasso for a long time, he never deviated from the, uh, the figure or nature or the image that we know around us. Uh, and when I saw this image of uh, Robert Motherwell, this really struck me. It was, I guess it was like when, the, uh, when a 12-year-old girl saw the Beatles for the first time. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I understand this. This has meaning to me. Uh, now, when I look back at from this perspective, you know, I go to the Museum of Modern Art and I see that painting. I think it's called The Voyager or something. I've forgotten. But I look at it and it has cracks in it and it looks like it's been there for centuries and it just has become a part of art. And so many people have imitated uh, this man or, and the abstract expressionist that it's sort of like Mozart. When you hear Mozart in the original, it's very thrilling. But at the same time, there's so many people have imitated this man and this period and this style and so forth that it takes some of the, um, uh, some of the um, sensational beauty from the, uh, for some people, it's for me it doesn't, but, and the same way with the abstract expressionist. I mean, so many people have imitated Pollock or and imitated some of those people that now they seem to be uh, not as important as significant or revolutionary or exciting as they were in their time. But now you decided to paint in, the, in that way. In mm -hmm. that, right? Yeah. But you saw, and this painting you sold probably was abstract. There so was an abstract about, painting. So, so did you then begin to paint because you saw other people painting that way? And then you said, yes. Yeah? Yes, that would be undeniable. Right. I was really thrilled and excited and uh, I, I simply, this way of painting suited my nature perfectly at the time. It was, I was highly energized, always uh, moving, full of <coughs> uh, excitement about life and um, this way of painting was just made for me. I just stretched these big canvases and, and attacked them and 
move the pain around. It, it's so strange because when the situation, when you're in the situation of painting like an abstract expressionist, and uh, you're surrounded by people, hardly anyone knew or understood this work, just a few artists and a few critics, and you're in the middle of it, you're looking at it, and what's peculiar is how you have the, the, the confidence to paint in this way. I mean, compared to the, uh, the scorn that Picasso must have gotten, uh, what I was going through was nothing. But, and moreover, I didn't mind any of the uh, slings and arrows from society. I kind of enjoyed myself. I, I was a, I, it was a great period of my life. Uh, but you're in it, and, and you, you have no standards. You're, you're flying blind, and yet somehow you know, I finished the picture and it looks great. Why? I don't know. It, just <laughs> it looks great. Some, some kind of intuition, some, uh, when I look back at them, uh, the ones that I thought were good and very powerful, I still feel that kind of, uh, uh, kind of sense that they, yeah, I did, I did a good job. I don't know how the hell I did it or why or what the impulses were. It is, it is a wonderful feeling when you're in something new. It's, it's very exciting. Well, well, you had, you had really rapid, good success. Oh, you, I did, and, yeah. And talk a little bit about that. Go right from the that, <coughs> and I think you ended up in the Guggenheim, the opening show, and who the crowd was there, and what that was like. Well, what happened was I started out painting, and I made very strong progress, very quick progress. I was right in my element. I was right at the right moment, at the right time. And one day, I remember, um, the other artists around me appreciated my work. In fact, I studied with uh, Hans Hoffman for a while, and I went in, and uh, he looked at some of my work, and I said, well, how much is He said, well, give me, I forget what, 25 bucks, and come until you don't feel like coming anymore. Because he knew that I already was at a level where I was not going to be staying with him for a long time. And so I did, and uh, I just progressed very fast. And, uh, and some of my friends said, you've got to go to a gallery. They literally took me by my feet and, my, and carried me and put me in the car and threw some paintings in. And we went around to, I forget what the gallery the Egan Gallery and the uh, Peridot Gallery and a whole bunch of them, the names I've forgotten. And almost everyone uh, was willing to accept my work. But the first one who did accept my work was the Peridot Gallery. And they had Philip Gustin in the gallery at the time, and he had some very interesting people. He had a wonderful Italian sculptor, Mirardo Rossi, who, who made works with wax and left them in that state, and they put them in the glass uh, uh, boxes. They're beautiful. <coughs> and he had Rosemary Beck and some others, uh, Paul Resick, I think, at the same time. And. Um, well, this story, you know, I can't remember the chronology of this story, exactly how it fit, but uh, I don't remember if this was, this must have been before the first show at the Guggenheim. I can't remember the whole business, but I was walking, I had just driven my work over from New Jersey to my gallery on Madison Avenue, and I was unloading this painting. It must have been about uh, eight feet long. It was a big black and white picture. I have a picture of it. I'll show you. It's in the catalog for the Guggenheim. Uh, and uh, I was getting it off, and I was scruffling, scuffling with it. It was covered with newspaper or something, so it didn't, it didn't. And uh, <coughs> I'm just kind of scruffling. Who do I see come down the road? James Johnson Sweeney, the director of the Guggenheim Museum. Now, you want to talk about audacity, the audacity of youth. <laughs> I said, Mr. Sweeney, you mind giving me a hand carrying this picture up to my gallery? And he was very graciously said, OK. And uh, he carried it up. He took one end. I took the other end. And up we went. And this is a kind of a, 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 this is kind of wonderful what happened. We stripped it down. And he took one look at it. And he bought it. And this is the painting. That was in the first show at the uh, Guggenheim Museum with all those marvelous artists, Picasso and Miro and uh, the, the, the whole gang, you know, Cezanne, uh, uh, just the, the, a, uh, a list of the world's great artists. And something else grew out of that, which is equally uh, astounding. <coughs> uh, 
uh, Miro was in the show, and he particularly liked this particular painting. And he told Jane Jones to Sweeney. Well, I was, of course, absolutely flattered and, and elated. And I, um, this actually was probably a little presumptuous on my part, but at any rate, I made a nice drawing and I said, thank you. I had someone translate this into Spanish. And thank you for very much. I admire you, an artist of your distinction, liking my work, and blah, blah, blah. And I sent it off and forgot all about it. And about three weeks later, I get a letter from Mallorca, Spain. And my heart started to pound. I said, <laughs> I wonder what's in this thing. And I opened this package, and here is a work of uh, Miro. And it's on one side, it's a red circle and crayon, and some drawing, and it says, gracias. And on the other side, it says in Spanish, with an affectionate greeting to Carmen Cicero, Juan Miro. Five colors, and blah, 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 blah. <coughs> and uh, I had it framed and so forth. Sad to say, this burned down in the fire with 40 other works. And from ecstasy to the agony, <laughs> it burned down in, in, uh, in the fire in the, in the 70s, early 70s, uh, with uh, 40 other works. This was a uh, blow. I do believe that this probably took out 20 years of my life, uh, because how are you going to duplicate 40 works? And it was at a period when figurative expressionism came on the scene, and that's what these works were. As far as I know, I was the first one, but I may be wrong. And uh, they were all burnt down. So it wasn't a case of just redoing what I'd done. Uh, that was out. But what, what the big problem was, was to find, to, to understand, to to determine what I was going to do. You know, what am I going to do? Am I going to go backwards? Am I going to go forwards? You know, what the hell am I going to do here? This is, uh, and I uh, decided to, well, I, j did, I did a couple of, you know, hard edge pictures and who got lost and had no success. And here I was a guy with, who had a background and now I had to go around hat in hand trying to get a gallery. It was very humiliating. It was extraordinarily unpleasant. But when I finally got a body of figurative expressionist works, I went around to a bunch of galleries, and they were all, once again, interested. And the first gallery that uh, took my work was um, the Gr Grand Modern. And they were, um, this was after the fire and after the Peridot. Uh, Lou Pollock of the Peridot had died, and, um, and the gallery closed, so I couldn't go back there. Anyway, the Graham Gallery took me, and Berta Walker was the director. And she was very good. And I was amazed that we sold some work because these pictures are big and ugly and <laughs> aggressive and <coughs> full, filled with, you'll see them in a minute. I'll look, look at them. Not, not like what you're doing now. No, no, I don't. What I'm doing now is, um, is a, a bit uh, mysterious even to me because I, I have, as a, as a person, I have a lot of vitality and energy, and uh, and I'm, I, I, and it seems the kind of work that would be suited to this kind of persona and this energetic person would be expressionist work, and which it was. But at one point, I began to make uh, pictures which had this uh, surreal, dreamy aspect to them. This. Uh, you know, I hate to use the word we were talking before, visionary aspect. <laughs> That's the best word, I guess, but every time I, I am a visionary, I think, Ugh. <laughs> I wince at the thought, but that's the best word I can think of. <clears throat> uh, so that began to creep in in 1985, and we'll take a look in a minute at one of those pictures from that period. Uh, and then I continued with my figurative expressionist thing. But this peculiar um, work, which is hard to name with this very moody uh, aspect to it, it could be, you know, I think all of us have this feeling in the middle of a sense of intense joy and that we feel at the same time uh, 
you know, death right around the corner. Uh, I don't mean so literally as that, or that I was morbid or whatever, but and one of the pictures, it's called, let me see, what's the name of that picture? Oh, Mr. Ghost Goes to Town. In that picture, uh, it was a very big abstract expressionist picture, and then I made a watercolor of it. That contains the feeling that I had at the time. You know, great success, climbing steadily, fire. Oh, life can play dirty tricks. Uh, life can um, whack you pretty hard and lay you down. And <laughs> you know, and sometimes I get the feeling that there, that um, a god is up there. God's looking down and says, Cicero, he's, ha he's having too good a time. <laughs> Give me a thunderbolt. <laughs> Goodbye, studio. <clears throat> you know what I want to do before we forget about it? I want you to just take a break for a second. Rolling in? Okay. No, I might as well leave everything yeah. in place. Uh, okay, well, here, Ed, this is the, uh, this is the book that uh, has this first inaugural show. And here is the painting. This is the, this is the work that um, this is the work that uh, James Johnson Sweeney helped me up with. I can't see. Can you see the size of it? It must be here someplace. I can't see it without my specs. Yeah. Anyway, it's big. And uh, anyway, that was the one that was in the show. And you can see if I look, there's a Stuart Davis and yeah, uh, all the, you know, all the boys. Yeah. Okay, say when. But we start with it out here. Could mm. you reach for it? Yeah. Okay, start again. Say when. Okay, here's the book. Here's the, uh, the uh, handbook for the Guggenheim Museum, and this is the inaug inaugural show. And this is the painting. It's, it's 100 inches, 80 by 100 inches. It's a big work. And um, that's the one that Sweeney helped me up to my gallery with. It's gigantic. Uh, it was just a wonderful show, and, and the artists are very impressive here. You've got, uh, oh, I don't know, my man, just... Uh, there's Baziotis, and there's Bonard, and uh, there's Paul Clay, and uh, Chagall, and Cicero, and uh, yeah, yeah, De Lune, I guess, and whoever these are. So you know, they're all but this, but this was a great high point in your life. It is. Right, to have been there with this moment at the Guggenheim, which it was, was the most exciting art moment That's in right. the city at that time. And not after, not long after, well, quite a ways time after, down went everything and uh, my career with it. It was very peculiar, you know, you talk about a minute of fame, two minutes, 15 minutes of fame and so forth. I got a little, I certainly was in no way famous by no stretch of the imagination, particularly by comparison with the other people there. And yet, there was a very odd thing happened. Um, I was talking to a couple of people, a couple of friends, and someone was standing there listening to us. I thought it was a friend of some of these people. I soon realized this person was just standing there listening to us talk, and he felt, hey, you know, he's a famous artist. I can sit here <laughs> and listen to what he's saying. You know, I, it was a very peculiar thing. and. Uh, I think from that moment on, I, I said, well, I'd love to have fame, but I don't want to be recognized. I want to be <laughs> the kind of guy that has fame, but that no one recognizes you on the street, so I could have the privacy of, of, a, of a life. And but, but art and fame have always been somehow banging house. And you were saying earlier, you're not yeah. really sure that the, uh, the three things artists really want. You know, oh, yeah. That that's, what, that's what we all say, or sometimes mockingly, sometimes, I guess, seriously. Uh, fame, money, and beautiful women. Uh, and I think, uh, certainly when you're young, you feel all of this. I feel quite differently now. For one thing, I have a wonderful wife, and we're very happy together and enjoy life enormously. And uh, secondly, uh, I find that when I have... Uh, I have sufficient money to enjoy life, and uh, the fame can press in on you. Uh, I, uh, as I said, maybe I'm, I'm, I'm not speaking from experience. Maybe if someone said, as we were talking before, well, here's $500 for that painting, Cicero, I'd say, well, that blows my theories. <laughs> Lay it on me. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'm not so sure, but I do have a fear of it because when things are going beautifully and you're happy and you're enjoying life, as I certainly am, go up to Cape in the summer, stay here, Mary and I travel, we 
she's an art historian. We enjoy going to museums. We just love the whole experience. We talk and laugh, and we ridicule each other. And she ridicules me. I ridicule her. We ridicule ourselves. She ridicules. <laughs> <laughs> Particularly, we the way we do ridicule ourselves, and we uh, find very amusing, is about teaching. How uh, you, how you're standing up there, and the next thing you know, you're. <laughs> pontificating and <laughs> and all of these uh, what I call I have a collection of frozen food packages up here intellectual frozen food and whenever the opportunity whenever, whenever the need arises <laughs> I just kind of take one out <laughs> and they're very effective <laughs> They're very effective, and you're constantly, I mean, you know what I should do? I should take these, for, and every time I use one, I should put a date on it. I think each one of them would have about 25 dates <laughs> used in 19, uh, 1972 to advise some young student uh, not to take up art or whatever, who knows. <clears throat> but, but in all reality, well, as I say, Mary and I, we do laugh at, I, we laugh at ourselves, you know carrying on as teachers, Mary does and I do, and how you can, carry, you can just carry on with it and, and think you're important and you get to, your ego is rubbed and massaged and it, it is a pecu peculiar profession. And I, I think you're, if you don't laugh at yourself, I, I, I mean sometimes I come home and I actually wince when I think of some of the things I said and how I was strutting around like a rooster in <laughs> my glass. <laughs> <laughs> it's pathetic. <clears throat> uh, but on the other hand, I do believe I impart some information about art and life and, uh, because I have been around. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But when you, when you look back over that, that period of time, I, I, my feeling is, and part of the reason I thought it was good to talk to you, is that your life kind of parallels the century a little bit. I mean, you're about mm -hmm. to go into a new century, mm -hmm. but in a way, your history of trying to paint, and even what you're painting now, if you are a visionary, you really represent the century. Do you feel that? Like you, I never thought of century? it. I never thought of it. The only thing that I can say is that in the early days, when I just started out, I was, I, I didn't know it at the time, but I was a kind of a existentialist, though I didn't even know the term. In as much as I was certainly alienated, I certainly, um, uh, my feelings about religion. I wasn't at all religious. I didn't believe, I just believed that the, that your life was determined from within some way and your, the course that you chose was self-directed and uh, that, the, and the people, here I am in first year college, I'm reading um, Thomas Mann and Herman Hesse and Melville and Joseph Conrad and <coughs> Uh, Faulkner and the, oh, everybody, Hemingway, and these people were awe-inspiring. Just, oh, these people are magnificent. And I'm listening to uh, <coughs> Igor Stravinsky and Ravel and Bach and Mozart, and I'm, I'm a classically trained musician. And uh, I'm looking at paintings of de Kooning and Klein. Now, that's alienated because nobody, just myself and a few friends, uh, were doing these things, and uh, but it was a kind of alienation that was absolutely delightful, because you felt separated, well, separated from the common folks, and um, and you were on an adventure into the new, and you felt special. Now, once again, I feel <laughs> alienated, but it doesn't have the same. I look at the, the television and you know some of these horrible shows. And uh, nobody reads books, nobody listens to fine music, or very few people at the college level. And so uh, you just feel like you're alienated, but there's nothing pleasant. You, you feel a disillusionment with it. Uh, because you see a society that seems to be moving downward, not upward. But I may be misreading it, I don't know, but that's what it seems like to me. Uh, reading, no. Um, fine music, no. Fine jazz, no. Fine poetry, no. Although uh, painting, it seems to be, people go to museums. I mean, you get to a museum if you have a big name like Van Gogh or somebody, it's, it's pretty crowded. In fact, more people go to museums than sporting events. But book reading, uh, I don't, or fine music, I mean, the record store tells me that 
classical music, <laughs> jazz. <laughs> so it's not all down. But it is, it is a, a 20th century cultural feeling. I mean, I don't want to put a label on it, but that's yeah. what it is. Can you sure. just pull yourself an inch forward? Sure. Okay. <coughs> it's, it's a 20th century cultural feeling you're talking about. Things are far into the 21st century if people like you who know that experience and value that experience mm -hmm. don't carry it forward. That's right. I don't know. Maybe all the technology and so forth. I think I'm going to say probably this is one of the most uh, cliche statements ever made, and yet I think it's very, very accurate and important. I'm a person who believes in democracy. I'm a person who doesn't believe in communism. I'm a person who believes in um, essentially the capitalist system and so forth. But what you have is this is the terrible part about it all. If the, the producers of television ask a simple question, how do I make the most money? And they look over the populace and they say, well, let's see. And by the way, I've heard the producers of television and film on Channel 13, our public radio station, talking about, and they say this, well, we make money, we, we don't want to make anything that the 12-year-old can understand. We want to make, uh, so what do they do? They just, they don't bring up anything. They just come down to anything. And the favorite subjects, as we all know, are sex, violence, and scandal. So sex, violence, and scandal comes out in profusion. And uh, it appeals to people. Uh, I c even I sit down and look at uh, Jerry Springer now and then. Oh, my God. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe these are morality lessons for people who are, have no morality. I don't know. Uh, it's hard to say. All I can say is this is, I have no contact with this. And if money, if capitalism is making money at, by whatever means possible, then this is, seems, it seems to me this is going to be perpetuated. And it doesn't bode well. But Octavio Paz wrote about this, you know. Who, who is? Octavio Paz. He's oh, a yes. American poet yes. talking about <coughs> you cannot yes. leave poetry up to the economic system. That they're, they're contradictory to one another. It's or sort art. of what sounds like you're saying. Or art. The funniest thing I've seen so far was there's a gallery opening up in New York, and what are they going to have? I think uh, Al Goldstein is involved in this gallery. Where are they going to have sexual performances? <laughs> this is the state of art in America today. Sexual, uh, probably, probably they'll have more people in that gallery than any any in New York City. <laughs> Do you think people are that good at it? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I I'm not, I'm, I'm certainly wouldn't say, you know, don't do this. Uh, I'm not sure. It is complicated. I, I, I guess what I do believe is a friend of mine from Norway said that they have a board of uh, censors, I guess you would call them. They're from a full spectrum politically, and they're not uh, puritanical. He said there's a lot of nudity, but there's certain things they don't believe should be on television because they think it's harmful to the society, and they don't allow it. As they say, they allow nudity, uh, and, uh, but they don't allow, I guess, things that they feel are overly violent or destructive to the family or whatever. I see no reason not to have that. Well, None. I agree. I, I want to try something out. I mean, we didn't talk about it at all before, but my feeling is, is that the television executives you talked about before have a way of getting out of responsibility for it because people, they say, want that. But they also deny that there is an effect from the images they give. It's almost <laughs> like saying, well, we aren't causing the violence we are. Isn't that sort of a funny? That's, that's absolutely what? silly. I mean, what uh, our, 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 we're driven by two things, essentially, our genetic code and our environment. And uh, what is our environment? <laughs> these producers that are making these, this television. Uh, and uh, anyone who believes that this doesn't have an effect. I do believe that, that, that there are intelligent and enlightened people who can take this in their stride. And not, look, I look at pornography now and then and enjoy it. I have nothing against it. But that doesn't mean I do a lot of things that other people would do and abuse. And uh, I think there are, there are a level of people, a class of people, who can uh, do uh, things because whatever, they're because of their background, their family stability, their psychological stability, or a variety of things that make them intelligent and, uh, and the civilized people. 
and they can experience things which would have a very negative effect on other sorts of people. And uh, so I don't, I guess we all feel the same. We don't want our goodies taken away, but those same goodies can create a situation that is destructful and, uh, then, and harmful, and that's the horn to the dilemma. And I'm, I, I do believe that, you know, a board of people from a, a political spectrum uh, that is uh, essentially liberal but has conservative elements as well can put censorship on television, maybe even if it's up to 11 o'clock at night or uh, so that uh, the society is not influenced badly. That's, I, I could live with that very easily. <coughs> well, okay. Uh, I'll give you a hard segue. Don't, don't keep the edge of that way. You can no, just scoot your chair. Scoot your chair. That way. That's it. Okay, because, because now I will say this. I don't even think artists are supposed to know everything about they, they paint. They're supposed no. to paint from their guts in some mm -hmm. way. But take a look at this. You know, you, mm. you, you know that people get affected when they look at your work. And well, yet, well, how do they get affected, or how do you intend to affect them? It's so interesting, you know? Well, I, I never think about that. That I must tell you. When tell I'm me, painting... Tell me, you never think about what? I never think about the effect that this is going to have on society. Um, let me see. How, how would I explain this? Um, well, this is interesting. One of the things I found a long time ago was that whether I was painting well or badly, or whatever style I was painting in, the work that I loved the most it was the first work to sell. And it was the first work to appeal to people. And it was the first work that had a good audience. And, um, and yet we're all uh, susceptible to, as an old orchestra leader used to say to his band, play pretty for the people. I forget who that was. You know what you better do? What? Because of that truck, let's take a little bit. That truck was so loud that when you started that point, when you, you know the orchestra leader, yeah. that was lost. So that sounds like that. We also hit this microphone. Did he? Okay, uh, so we want to start that story. Oh, okay, it yeah, is a funny it's story. A cute, cute story. I forget what his name was, uh, this orchestra leader, but uh, he played uh, it. It was before. The, it was when you were talking about relationships. Oh, yes. Arts. What yeah, I yeah. discovered was that the work that I liked the most, and this is all going to go to the point of what I do when I'm painting these works, the point, the wor work that I loved the most was the work that everybody wanted. They bought it or they admired it or whatever. And, uh, and yet, at the same time, there's an impulse in our, our weakness is when uh, we, we want to do what this orchestra leader does, play pretty for the people, you know, and, uh, and get more applause and uh, pander and so forth. There is that dimension. Now I've reached a point in my life where I have just none of this matters truly, and I just paint, and I don't stop until I create a vision that is consistent with the inner vision. This, we talked about this, what I see as ethics. You have an inner vision, and you honestly reveal that vision, sometimes in metaphor, you can't always do it literally. You reveal that vision in your art uh, as perfectly as you can and without compromise. Then you're ethical. I think that's what ethics is, or a certain kind of ethics. I mean, there, there are codes of behavior and, uh, that, or religions and so forth where you follow the, uh, the laws of the religion or the code of behavior. But for me, it's following that truth within. Uh, Joe Campbell says, following your bliss, the, the ancient um, people, uh, the Buddhists and the Zen Buddhists. I, I love those people. Uh, but at any rate, <coughs> what about that piece so, right there? That, that okay. Piece, what, so you can hold that up. For yeah. Us. So so with these, well, t let's take this one. This is called a tracer of lost persons. With these things, I said I'm just going to stay with this until it coincides perfectly with my deep and inner vision. And the thing that I found about this, and I'll put it down, <coughs> is once again when I go to that which is the most personal and most deep. In some paradoxical way, it touches the largest number of people. Uh, I guess if you're an artist, well, I suppose that's what uh, Louis Armstrong does and Charlie Parker. They're just playing their heart out. They're playing directly from their heart, which is very personal and very deep, and somehow it touches a broad audience. And so uh, and that's a very ethical procedure. I mean, they may not be ethical people in their daily lives, but at that point, and a lot of them ain't, <laughs> at that point, they are. Uh, and the same with this one. 
Uh, I'm not even I'm not exactly positive what I'm trying to say with this. I, I really don't care, but it has something to do with um, this, the uh, wonderful experience that I would sometimes feel if I was sitting on the seashore, and I think we've all had this, you're sitting on the, uh, on the seashore and a low-flying plane comes by slowly right across the horizon. It, boy, it, gets, got, it has everyone's attention. Everyone is staring at this thing. And, uh, and particularly old airplanes. They're almost like kites, you know, canvas-covered wings and um, painted symbols on them. They're very colorful and beautiful image of things to look at. And one of those flying low over past a certain kind of very still and surreal uh, haunting landscape is something that I find very gripping and touching to me. Mm -hmm. And so I said, I'm just going to keep at it until I get it. And I'm going to make it exactly the way I would love to see it. And apparently, I call it the ghost because it is ghostly. Um, mm -hmm. And apparently others feel this way. Particularly interested in that man <coughs> going across that bridge. You know, maybe you can even get a well, close-up. Well, you know, just let me get a close-up of that. You know, I think there, are, there, I think there are possibly psychological uh, aspects to it. It's probably I've made a lot of pictures where you find automobiles and peculiar landscapes. I think it has something to do with the journey through life. If I'm going to do a little self-analysis, and I, I find this very tricky business. But, you know, that trip through life, that searching mm -hmm. trip where we, you know, where I'm, what am I doing, what's going on, uh, uh, finding oneself on a surreal plane and... Uh, well, I'm going to jump back to one thing because I think as we're talking about your life and your, your thoughts, at one point you said something about not having to believe in God or mm -hmm. you didn't have to worry about that. Is what, is that an important part of your life? A lot of people feel that the, that the afterlife, suppose the after century is the afterlife in some way. Do you have to have a faith in something other than the world you're in? Or are you very comfortable that this is it? Well, no, I'm not comfortable about dying I'm <laughs> at all. I'd like to postpone it for as long as possible. I, I, I really, I'd like to live to 500 years if I could. I, I enjoy life immensely. I truly do. I, I'd love to just go on and on with it. I'd like to have more of the vitality of youth. Uh, the, the thought of death is, the main rub about it is the, uh, the um, loss of consciousness. You're not going to be aware. That's the part that I find very frightening. You're, you're not going to know what's going on. <laughs> you're out of the loop. <laughs> Sorry, if things are happening, but you don't know about them. You will not know about them. You will not see them. You will not be aware of, of them. Uh, there's something about that as a thought. Of course, when I'm unaware of this, it won't matter. But I'm not unaware of it at the moment. And so uh, uh, that's the part about death that, of course, if it hurts while you're while you're on the final glide path, <laughs> if it's painful, oh, that I hope it's not that. But the, the end of the century is a little like that, isn't it? I, I, I keep thinking some people think that the millennium is going to be a very important moment, that everything beforehand is one thing and then everything after is I know. What it's do just going to glide in smoothly and things are going to be held over from... 1900 to 2000, just going to move that. I mean, nature doesn't uh, care about the date, <laughs> or uh, neither does uh, the mass of humanity. I mean, there's some people that don't even have the same calendar, so it's not going to mean a damn thing to them. And it uh, doesn't particularly mean a whole lot. It's just a demar demarcation. I remember when I was a kid saying, gee, I wonder if I'll ever live to the year 2000. <laughs> And if, it looks like I'm going to, and uh, I'm damn glad of it, as long as I have the vitality to enjoy life and uh, move on. I would actually, talking about moving on, I'd like to move on and maybe move, move to some of the things Let's that were. Let's do that. Let's, before we move, take a look at this painting over here. <coughs> I see it right over here. What is the story with this one? Oh, that, that's a... Uh, now, you, there are two kinds of paintings that you're going to see. Well, there's actually three, but the third kind is gone. This is my abstract expressionist pictures. They're not here. 
then there's the figurative expressionist picture. This is one of that sort. But at the same time, it has a touch of that peculiar, visionary, surreal, whatever mm -hmm. aspect to it. And I made this picture, uh, the first copy, the first edition, the first issue, whatever, I can't think of the right word. Mm -hmm. The first one was about 10 years ago. And I loved the idea, but I didn't like the way I rendered it. Mm -hmm. And so now that I've gotten more skills in the use of watercolor, and boy, what an intimidating medium that is, now that I know that more, I, um, I said I'd like to do it and do it well, and I, I feel that I have here. But again, it's, that, it's the same story as this, the you know, tracer of lost person. The car is, this is, this is Cicero speculation psychologically, which is walking on thin ice and dangerous territory and it's pure speculation. But the car could very well be that trip through life and those fears and, and the lights that one senses on the journey and the mysteries and, and uh, such. And but, uh, but it is true that other people looking at your stuff, and I'm only talking about a few people that I know, they pick up on their own stories. They have their own reactions to it, even no matter what you did. So you're essentially, you're offering them something. Well, yes, that's, I don't, it's okay by me. I don't, I don't care. Well, the only way I think about it is, um, w uh, wouldn't it be fascinating if you actually were in that car and you were going through that particular scene? You're brought, driving through that, your fear and uncomfortableness and your curiosity and your uh, uh, visual involvement. As, as for example, when I was a kid, my father used to take us to see all those Christmas trees when the snow was falling. And this vista of all these beautiful trees, some all blue, some various colors in the snow, it was a wonder to me. And I guess I still have this impulse of flowing through life and seeing wonderful things. Well, not to be repetitive, <coughs> but isn't that sort of the question here? I wonder what it would feel like, and I have that reaction when I look at this, I wonder what it would feel like to being this that, guy, that, walking in that this road. night, yeah. walking across. Yeah, and that's, that to me is what, um, what I feel like when I do it. It's frozen in time. It's a moment frozen in time, but one, when you put yourself in that uh, position, you know if someone suddenly thrust you in this position, you know you're going to have some very peculiar emotions flowing through your body <laughs> and mind. Yeah, it's going to be... Well, that's what these later works are about, are it's really quite, in one sense they're complicated and, and uh, have a great deal of depth, but in another sense they're very simple. It would, and uh, that simpl simplicity can be summed up by saying, how would you feel under these circumstances? You look at that um, artichoke, that's from a vision, <coughs> that is from a vision that I have, uh, I would say 30 years ago and I remember it till today. Uh, seeing it in, in a kind of a, uh, a dream-like state. Uh, some, when the pictures come out in this inspired way, which is they come out total and total. Uh, the, the scene is here and it, you just now have to put it there. Uh, it sounds easy, but it isn't. <coughs> because sometimes you have to find a metaphor. You can't put it literally down. But when that one came up, I, 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 I said, I can't do it, but maybe one day I will. And I, I finally have. Oh, I see you sketching it again. Yeah, that's, now it's going to be, because I, it wasn't just this. The first one was just the artichoke. And then the second scene was uh, the artichoke with dew on it. And then the third one was the artichoke placed on, in the window of a jewelry store on a black velvet pillow with the dew. And it looked like... <laughs> <laughs> it looked like a, a some kind of beautiful icon or gem or, or a piece of exotic jewelry. And then the, the third and last was this artichoke now was uh, 125 feet high, painted, uh, placed in Central Park in the moonlight, painted green like a, a bench, you know, and <laughs> having little rails around the leaves because people had climbed up and almost fallen off and the city decided you better not <laughs> you better not have people climb up and people would drink beers and throw them and they would get caught and where the leaves <laughs> scraps and dust and so forth 
And these are, I don't know, it's sort of like the story of life, you know, the fantastic and the practical. And that is kind of like that. <laughs> so I'll, I'll, pro I'll probably make a few more of them. Yeah. Well, listen, why don't we? Okay, well, this is the snapshot wall. Mm -hmm. This is the yeah. family wall. Okay, what, what do we got here? Well, what we have here, this, uh, of course, Mary and I, and this is uh, in Provincetown. Uh, Joel uh, Meyerwitz took these pictures. And he took us here, and we didn't know what to do, so we just kind of stood there uh, like uh, sat. And then he said, do something wild, Cicero. So I picked up Mary like that, and I growled like a wild tiger. That's it. That's good. And these are uh, only a couple of years ago. Mary and I got married in Truro. We had a wonderful time. We've had a lot of wonderful times. And this is a scene from our backyard in Truro, our Truro house. We, somebody gave us this as a wedding gift. It's really beautiful. Water comes out of it. And this is one of my first shows in, in New York. This is after my fire. And one of my students in the back, very lovely gal, as Lee Savage. And this is Mary and I, both these, these two, when we first got together in New York, we used to just run around this town like two crazy people and have just a hell of a good time. That's all. Um, <coughs> yeah. Just make sure I have a close up on this one. I think that's a great, that's a en good ending button. Mm -hmm. I'll come to it on a little move. Hmm? Okay. All right, let me get, let me get this one again. Okay. Uh, when you start rolling, wait wait until he's about to talk. I'll talk for a little bit. You'll be on this. Okay? okay. All right. Carmen, you, you were talking about your work, and this is, you know, the new stuff and the evocative stuff. This is an example of some of that stuff. Okay? Yes. This is, uh, uh, you know, there, there's not a hell of a lot you can say about this because it's there for you. Uh, the experience is to simply look at it. You get a particular kind of feeling when you do look at it, uh, and that's pretty much up to the viewer. There were a lot of technical problems that I had. <coughs> Probably the biggest one was getting the right color for this canoe. First it was bright and white, and then it was blue, and then it was a real dark gray. I wanted it to look mysterious. And then I brought it back, and finally I got this kind of ash gray, and it seemed to be the right mood. Other peculiar things. I want you to say something else, and which is, we were talking about this before. Is there, does the canoe or any of this sort of stuff mean anything in particular? Uh, it probably does, but those would be psychological things, and that would be pure speculation. I, I, I could, spe yeah, yeah I, I could, I could speculate on it, but I don't know. Uh, I'm, that's always very tricky and. And who knows if you're right or wrong. I remember living on a property with a couple of soda psychiatrists, and they would talk about symbols and this and that. And I was pretty good at it. And, uh, but they would have a lot of disagreements, and they were experts. And so uh, <laughs> who am I then to uh, speculate it? I could say all sorts of things. Uh, uh, it's loneliness. It's drifting and through life. I don't think it's much. <coughs> I just got involved in things like this sweep that comes up here and moves around here and then comes out here, points back to here to give rhythm and so forth. Uh, to go back to some of the principles of painting that happened years ago when I first started, I, I feel a strong compulsion to go back. Sometimes going backwards is going forward. Okay, let's let's not let's not over let's not over chew on one paint. And okay, all right. This one doesn't look like your other stuff, does it? And I want no, you to look at doesn't. the related to painting, but you know, it really is something else going on. You you have an idea for this? No, one? Uh, this this picture. You know, I have one hell of a time talking about them because they're like uh, it's like a poem. 
you try to put it in other words, it's, it's almost ridiculous. It's a visual experience. How do you feel when you look at a particular thing uh, at a particular moment? That's what this is about. There are, I have problems. I mean, I could talk about the problems involved in painting it, but those are technical things that people aren't, uh, the sky was changed many, many, many times. This color was devilish to get, and um, it was all purple, and then I, I didn't like that, and I wanted it to look like a bed where water would run, and so I wanted it to be slightly different than the background. But these are all just not very interesting technical aspects to the picture, and the painting of the picture, rather. Okay. But the would you, would you tell me? Would you tell me that part where you said you wanted it? What did you want it to look like? Uh, you said a bed? A what? A bed, did you say? Yes, the, a bed, right well, tell here. Tell me that. Tell me that. Well, well, that's only because I wanted to, wanted it to look like a place. Him for this. Okay. Yeah, I wanted it to look like a place that water runs, that it, it, water had been there before and now was uh, once again running. I also wanted it to look like it was n not of this world. It looked like it was someplace other than. Okay. I want you to this tell world. me that, but I want you to talk to me instead of to the painting, yeah. okay? Because I want he'll come to the painting and then come back to you, okay? So you 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 when you say other world, you wanted it to. I wanted it. To, I I didn't want it to look like this world, but I didn't want it at the same time to look uh, like science fiction or something. I wanted it to look uh, like a place that. Um, um, was very unfamiliar and very, uh, and produced a very uncomfortable feeling in mm -hmm. the viewer, mm -hmm. uh, and yet a, a compelling feeling. Mm -hmm. But those things are strictly up to the viewer. This, I just paint what I truly, deeply want to see. And uh, as I said before, when you touch that which is deep within yourself and your own humanity, it seems that some peculiar way you touch the deep humanity of others. Of course, there are some people whose humanity is never touched, and uh, <laughs> those kinds of people have no part in my life or mm -hmm. the life of my friend, so. Okay, let's go right over <coughs> here. Let's take one little walk uh, Something that uh, I, I uh, reminds me of this poem by uh, Wordsworth, where he says, when off upon my couch I lie, in vacant or in pensive mood, they flash upon the inward eye, which is the bliss of solitude. Well, this flashed upon the inward eye, and uh, it was just a very peculiar and fascinating experience to watch this peculiarity transform in this peculiar mental state that I was in, from an artichoke to a uh, to a jewel, an icon, whatever, covered with dew, lying on a, uh, on a black uh, jeweler's cushion in the jeweler's window. It looked like it was perfectly natural in that state. And then the third state was uh, an artichoke 100, 200 feet high, painted green like it was a feature of, a, of Central Park for years, standing there with a little fence around it. A uh, little fence around the leaves, people and kids climbing up in it, and uh, leaves breaking off, and wire rods sticking out from the leaves. It, these were the uh, sequence of uh, thoughts, and this was, oh, I would say, 30 years ago. And I thought, one day I'd like to paint this, and here it is. And I want to paint a few more, of a few more versions of this. Did anybody, I mean, obviously an important difference between almost anything you do and what anybody else does is your skies. Mm. To speak specifically, <coughs> you, you, you almost, anybody could look at some of your paintings and say, ah. Well, I, I like, uh, there are certain very cliche uh, ideas about, uh, uh, about beauty and about mystery and about... Uh, uh, about, well, beauty and mystery. And one of them is people love uh, sunset skies. They love moons. And so I do too. Who doesn't love a sunset sky? But had, it has been abused and abused by painters for so long 
that to paint a sunset sky, you're really taking a chance. And I just decided uh, that's really what I truly want to see. I want to see a sunset sky. I want to see a moon. I want to feel the poetry of a moon, uh, which appears in many of my pictures. I love the who doesn't look at the moon. Uh, the, but artists have avoided this uh, because it's been used and abused. And I just decided, no, I'm just going to paint exactly. Again, I had this feeling to, I need to go backwards to, uh, to move from the chaos of the present time because the art scene is without question in a state of chaos. Nobody knows what's going on. The most experienced person in the art world does not know what's going on in the art world. Everybody believes that their little bit of uh, terrain and their group of artists are in the avant-garde. And, and uh, some people think it's performance art. Some people think it's political art. Some people think it's this art, that art, and the other art, uh, television art, and so forth. I don't know who's right. I don't care who's right. I deeply do not care. It's not an affectation. It's not sophomoric. It's I just don't give a hoot. And I'm... If I just strongly and intuitively feel to go that I have to go back to the fundamental principles. I don't think of it that way. I just intuitively go back to these things. I'm not guiding myself back. And, uh, you know, what's painting in its original form? Some guy sits down and he draws a... Um, he tells a story with, uh, with a piece of coal or a piece of charcoal. And then he gets people get better and better at doing it, and um, then they learn to compose things and to put them in night order and so forth and so on. And that's exactly what I'm doing, and I'm going to my deepest recesses and uh, putting these things forth. And I feel very much at home doing it. Mm. Okay, let's move to the next row. Okay. This painting has a special meaning. This is not just any old painting. No, it's a painting I want to keep. Uh, be I painted this in 1985. This was long before I started my new work. I still have, I feel uncomfortable about naming it, but it, uh, it's a kind of a precursor of what I am now doing. And when I painted it, I didn't think it was possible to um, capture and convey this kind of mood and feeling uh, it actually comes from my, I lived in Newark, New Jersey for a while, and in the summertime everybody, I used to play with bands, and the bands would leave and play the summer job sometimes, and I was very disappointed when I didn't get a job. Okay. Oh, it doesn't look good? Uh, oh. against the white pillar, and okay. uh, can we just tape it to the back of just It wasn't taped at all. Wasn't taped. Instead of worrying about the, the, the moon, let's just start wide and say, start when you said when you were living in Newark. Well, when I was in living when I was living in Newark, um, I uh, used to love to play with bands, and I'd love to go away for the summers and to play with uh, play on at the Borscht Belt. And I did most summers, but every now and then I didn't. And I had to stay in the city, in Newark, New Jersey, in the summertime. And it was hot, and it was sunny, and it was extremely depressing to me. Not that the city was so much was depressing, but when all of my friends left, and I uh, uh, now was remained alone, I wasn't playing. And uh, there are certain kind of very uncomfortable and lonely feelings about the city and my circumstances and such, and I would look at some of these, they're sort of like project houses, and uh, some beating down on them, and the strange emotions. I think most people would have it, have these kinds of feelings. But I thought, I thought, is it possible really to capture that in a painting? And uh, I attempted to do it, and I, uh, for myself, I was successful. Then when I went to uh, Cape Cod, where we have a summer gallery. It was a great gallery. Robert Motherwell was in it, and um, Sidio uh, Frambaluti, and Nora Spire, and uh, Bud Hopkins, and um, oh, just a very Jean Bogosian, just wonderful people. 
uh, uh, well, this was a picture that uh, the artist loved, and that was very surprising to me. Uh, and I thought, well, maybe I can move in this direction, and maybe it is possible to paint pictures in which uh, some one's deepest feelings, my deepest feelings, are um, registered, and they can be read by others. And uh, I kind of drifted away from the idea and went on with my figurative expressionist stuff. But then ultimately, as you can see in these newer works, I came back to this and I was able to do it at least well, good enough for my satisfaction. Would you like to see another one? <coughs> now here, I'm going to take this off and I'll put this. You want to just take this out? Can I walk over here and grab? <coughs> well, now, I'm, as, I'm not going to say anything about this, maybe a couple of words, uh, because it, they really speak for themselves. And as I said, they're what, what they're about is what you feel and think when you, when you look at them. Peculiar kind of an enigma. And, I can only say that they're very hard for me to paint because I, I wasn't trained in this way of painting at all. I came in as an abstract expressionist where you just feel and paint and feel and paint and I got pretty good at it. But So this is just, maybe other painters would could do the same thing a lot quicker, I don't know. They're, each one is a peculiar. I feel like I'm living through the whole experience. They go on for months and months. I don't make very many of them. And I know I'm ultimately going to have problems with galleries because uh, I don't make enough work. But I have no intention of changing my pace. Okay, I'd like to show you another one now. <coughs> My hardest problem was figuring out what color I was going to make the scarf. <laughs> that was my most difficult problem, because it's slightly out of key when you look at it, and, uh, but it's okay. <coughs> this is, uh, no, let me get some, put it here. Not sure how we're going to do this one. I think this one we might have to do like this because it's too difficult to put it up there. Is that okay? 
this is another, uh, this is peculiar because I started it in 1988. And um, it, was it was reproduced in a catalog, so I really shouldn't touch it. But uh, when I first painted it, it had this little sailboat in it. And I took it out because it, it had a comical aspect that I didn't want in my work. <coughs> And then I decided that I could manage it if I was very careful. And I made some alterations, which are hard to describe. And uh, I painted the, um, the sailboat uh, in a very, uh, it's impossible to describe, in a way that made it look like it was very much a part of the picture. It wasn't. Um, it wasn't any kind of an anomaly in the picture. And it's, it seems right to me. I, I think of it, of, of, it's called smooth sailing. And I think it of, of it as a tale of uh, comedy and terror. Well, if this is right, it's, it's, uh, it's in jeopardy. Most definitely. <laughs> <laughs> It's not like that plane. It's interesting. The plane is flying in mm -hmm. perfect humming. This is in jeopardy. But it's, it's similar. In some ways. It's, everything is placed and it's frozen in time. And I think it, the picture is composed in such a way that uh, it remains still. It's locked in space. I think the only way you can get away with this is if the picture is painted perfectly. If it's not painted. At least when I say perfectly, I mean it's revealed when you look at it that the artist put a lot of time and love and effort into the picture. And so when you see that, uh, even on that alone, you, you, you pay more attention to it and give it more respect. You, feel may, you may like it or dislike it. And it may be good or bad, but there's one thing you know, it wasn't tossed off. I, am I want you to get a piece of just the sun. <coughs> you have the wide thing, right? So just a fairly rapid move from the sun down to the sailboat. Okay. <coughs> My line okay? Okay. Now we'll get, uh, I'll disconnect this and we'll get. Um, Okay, that? right there. Okay. All right. Is he, is he okay now? Can you do that? Mm-hmm. Uh, I just don't want you to stumble over this. Let this. Let's step over this side of it. Is that better? Here. That way. That way. Can you let it trail this way? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Are you ready to go? Yeah. Say when. When. Okay. All right. Here, I'll just rest this here. How's that look? OK. 
Okay. <coughs> well, this has just gone through so many versions, and I had a face in the sky at one point, and sunset sky and yellow skies and all sorts of things. And then the mood began to emerge, which was a very uh, quiet, strange, remote evening somewhere on some kind of an island or something, with a boat adrift drifting into shore. One of the things I, I have to be very careful about is naming a picture before it's complete because then you strive to make the picture suit the name and you just create a very bad problem for yourself. <coughs> I think that life is like that too. If you have to watch out that you don't put yourself in a box, those uh, self-fulfilling promises are, uh, that give people so much trouble. Anyway, when it finally emerged, it did look very much like what I had in mind at one point, which was it looked like a scene from uh, a Joseph Conrad story, an author whom I have the highest regard for. A very wonderful and magical writer. <coughs> I think the, the picture uh, speaks for itself. I did things like put these lines that point to the boat and that point to the boat, then the boat going up again, and that's kind of cup in the trees and in the moon. The skies are always murderous because they're so vast that uh, finding, if, you, if you're using a single color, to find a single color that functions with the rest is uh, the job. So I have a variety of colors. I can't get it too busy. But at any rate, it pretty much speaks for itself. You have a little touch of color in that boat that reminds me of the touch of color in the scarf. You know, like I bet you mm -hmm. know that that was going to be a little light blue. <laughs> oh, yeah, that blue. It had to have slight color anomaly, I think, uh, to give it a little, just a, uh, just a little variety, but has to be very careful. The other thing is the outline of the trees becomes a problem in and of itself. The path seems to be mysteriously yeah. disappearing, too, doesn't it? <laughs> All of these, I'm not sure, I'm sure they have some kind of psychological underpinnings, undertone to it, um, because all of them, uh, well, not all of them, but many of them have that dimension of um, uh, unexplained, um, I, you know, in my catalog, I'm calling these pictures unseen events. Uh, and that's the feeling I get. It, the only people privy to the scene are the viewers of the painting. <coughs> I think that could be part of the pleasure of the, of the painting, too. The fact that you're, you're looking at something that um, there are no other people or no other, there's nothing, no one else is looking. It's just happening. Uh, the idea, I know, well, all of these ideas of, of, um, are, are very appealing to me. I can tell you, uh, I love boats. I go out on Cape Cod Bay, I fish. I mean, that's one of my great joys of life. And a boat adrift is always fascinating, particular to a person who loves water and loves fishing and so forth. I can just picture myself on a kind of deserted seashore and I'm looking out and I'm watching the boats very slowly drifting to shore, you know, then getting caught up in the waves and then finally s hitting gravel and scratching and moving in on the shore and the desire to go to it and look into it and try to understand what happened to it. You know, there is another connection and that is the connection with, uh, do you know that painting by uh, Winslow Homer of, uh, uh, I, forgot, I think it's, 
Gulf Stream or something, it's a boat drifting that has a broken mast. There's something of that that uh, probably touched me. That's also a mysterious picture where you wonder. I tell you, when I was a young guy painting in the abstract expressionist manner, narrative was, this was, uh, this was the biggest of all sins. This was a, <coughs> oh. and intellectually I knew that um, the frequently the, 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 uh, the new artist is just rebels against the old art. And uh, I knew this intellectually, and I certainly wasn't going to intellectually say, well, I think I'll rebel against uh, the abstract expressionism. And what's the abstract, what, what should I do? Well, I, have, I can't paint flat anymore. I can't paint with a storyline. I can't, on and on and on. And now I'm doing the very thing that uh, I was, uh, you know, this, my Sunday school teacher told me not to do. <laughs> Why don't we just cut here for a second? What I want you to do. While he's getting it ready. Okay. What I want to do now is, uh, is, is you. S I, w I want to talk specifically about oh. a couple things, but I don't want to cut you off. Okay. Mm -hmm. Carmen, uh, you really put your life into these things and you're in a new place. Mm -hmm. you, you really still have the hopes of connecting with your audience. And if one moment you say you paint, the next minute you say, but if I paint from my heart, people will connect. Yes. How important is that connection? And when do, do you see it anywhere? It, it, I, I have to say it goes in and out. I mean, there, there are some times I have to say, I have to own up that I kind of lust for uh, a lot of powerful recognition and, you know, I, I should get what I deserve and you know, all the usual things like that. And there are other moments when I feel uh, that's the last thing in the world I want because it's going to disrupt a state of uh, joy and happiness that I have right now. I, I think the joy and the happiness that I have right now comes in part from this, uh, the circumstances of my life, which are perfect. And the other thing is, uh, Motherwell once said to me, well, a painter learns painting from painters and paintings. And I believe that's true. But at this particular point in my life, though I'm sure that uh, all the influences and all the thoughts I've ever had about painters and paintings and, and looking at thousands of them are, are part of my unconscious uh, apparatus, at the same time I feel more individual, more close to my uh, center, more, more um, uh, original, and, I don't, the word may not be original, but more closer to my inner truth and less influenced by that which is around me. I'm certainly not influenced about any current movements in art <laughs> because I don't know any movement in art which encompasses this, but I would feel very delighted to see other artists doing something like this. It would be kind of thrilling and interesting. I'd, I'd love to see it. Maybe, maybe there are some out there. And would it be uh, mood, or would it be called narrative? Is it now? You said you said it's a terrible word. Then do you want to be called narrative? Is it now still a bad word? A visionary, or what was that again? Narrative. 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 I don't know. I'm not. I, I'm. I'm not sure if I am narrative. In this sense, it's hard to explain all of this. As we said before, while we were talking. Um, the point of the picture, or it's hard to talk about. When I uh, look at my work, I'm looking at something that touches me deeply. And it's that thing that I'm looking at. It's in a frozen state. Uh, and it, um, it's, it's a story seems to have you know, a beginning, a middle, and an end to it. And, uh, I, and so does a narrative. This, this has no motion forward, uh, and so it's not a narrative in that sense. It is just a visual moment. It's a visual moment, and that visual moment is very, to me, very compelling and very fascinating. I have visual, I've had visual moments in my life that weren't paintings that have the power, I cannot tell you. They weren't stories. Or so, for example, I was in Yugoslavia, 
and I uh, had to go to the bathroom. And so I stopped the car, this is in a remote area, and I saw a little path, and I, no one's around, but I still had to <laughs> go and hide. <laughs> and I walked up the path, and at the end of the path, I saw a beautiful lake, gorgeous lake. And across the lake were cypress trees. And the sky was blue going into pale pink. The, that particular uh, moody kind of sky, for me it is anyway, and right up, a crescent moon. And I looked at this, it was spellbinding, and I looked down, and what do I see in this lake? No more than five feet from the shore, a trout that big. And that trout was, hurt, was floating in the water, and his tail was moving very slowly, and his dorsal fin was slightly out of the water. And I just looked at this whole vista. This was as absolutely captivating, this, I'm talking, this took place in the 60s. This scene was totally captivating and stays with me from then till now. Finally, I just staring at the trout and suddenly goes blip and takes off and leaves these rings in the water from that dorsal fin. And I just found this extraordinary. Now, that's not really a narrative. I don't know what it is. It, it's a visual, that's the way I think of these. There's not a story there. It's just a visual incident. That's more the way I like to think of them. You also teach. I teach. Okay. And your love of the classics comes through in our conversation. You're imparting something to your students. Are they going to carry forward? Do you, do you feel optimistic that, that the things that you care about and the things that you see about, they're coming forward? And you, do you see in your students a certain kind of talent and hope there? What, what is the I find it, I, I, it's difficult, it's very difficult. I, first of all, they're totally uneducated, that's one thing. They're not dumb, they're intelligent. Who are they? My, my students at uh, Montclair State University, they're not dumb at all. And I, I tell you, I, I, I like them a lot. I, I, do, I don't want to teach, a, if I had to teach a lot, I wouldn't like them a lot. But I like them a lot because uh, they're young and uh, I think what makes it possible is I come from, in from New York, I'm a, I'm a spectacle. They've never seen a Cicero because, you know, they come from the Fig Newton or New Jersey someplace, who knows. <laughs> they come in, I'm, I'm a spectacle more than I'm an educator. I walk around, I'm full of energy and say things they've never heard. And then when I get their attention, they're, they're, they're spellbound. They're looking at me like this. <coughs> uh, and I, I, I talk about my experiences so that they can identify me. In other words, I want them to know who it is that is standing before them. And so uh, this may not be okay with the administration, but then again, who in the administration has my background? I, I taught at eight colleges. I'm a distinguished in my field and such as that. So I think my view of education is, is as good as anybody's. But hey, if they get to know me, then they're going to value what I say. You know, the man's been around. He's done this, that, and the other thing. And so let's hear now. Let's listen to what he has to say. You know, he's established himself as a person and a human being. And then I uh, I reveal then my job is to impart what I know about art and what the meaning of art is and so forth. But this, I think, is, becomes much more effective when I reveal who I am in the process of telling them, because otherwise it's just a disembodied voice coming from, why should they pay any attention to where this, this voice is coming from? Sometimes, I think my greatest weakness is that I'm sometimes overbearing, and that's only because uh, of I, you know, come in from New York. I go to the Port Authority and so forth. Well, I, I enjoy. I don't, I'm not a believer in immigration, but despite that, I enjoy the people from other countries. I sit down and I listen to them talk about their background and their culture, and I find it very fascinating. And th they can tell by my demeanor that I am genuinely interested. I want to hear all about it, and uh, and then they. They get to work and they start doing things and they come up with some marvelous stuff. Uh, and uh, they, they feel 
I know they feel at home in my class. I got 40 students, and they're, so, they're busy working like hell in the class, and they're enjoying what they're doing. They run up to me and say, how's this? Is this right? But, so uh, it's, it's working, uh, and it's fine. I think it's working because I like to do it. One part of me says, oh, I can't stand this anymore. I don't want to do it anymore. I want to do my painting. But somehow the other, par the other part of me says, this gives me something. It gives me something as a person. It revitalizes me. I'm in contact with the way the world is moving on. Uh, it's, it's amazing um, uh, 